Welcome to the Kit Car History File series where we'll be going through the industry's past. We'll be visiting old marks of long ago, some modern ones, some mostly older stuff, a lot of archive information with photographs and information on the cars they made, the people involved and what happened to them. Hi, my name's Steve Holt, editor of TKC Mag and TotalKitCar.com. Welcome to the Total Kit Car History Files series. Uh, we have another episode for you today and um, just like to start by saying if you're new round here, if you're old round here, or if you don't know how you ended up here because you were looking for a fishing channel, um, you're welcome. I really, really do appreciate you, you visiting us and uh, I, I warmly welcome you. Um, just in case you don't know, this series, which now amounts to quite a few videos, I think, already, or audio videos anyway, um, we look at the uh, kit car industry's past. 1949 was when uh, the great character that was Derek Buckler tentatively uh, launched his uh, replica, well, a replica chassis kit of his little hill climb car. Uh, the Mark V, even though it was only his, uh, his first car, but he didn't want people to think it was his, uh, he was a rookie. Um, 1949 is a long time ago, and so therefore there's been lots of manufacturers, lots of characters, lots of cars, lots of marks, lots of things that we can talk about here in this little series. And we will. Um, we'll continue doing these. There's enough material, enough of a target area for us to continue for quite a long time. And uh, we really we release these uh, weekly these these uh, history file series videos, and um, we do them in association with Inwinds Motors and our video video editor Neil Winnington, that's his channel, and he does a a feature video every month for our channel. We we, we put that on at the start of usually the first of each month, and then the rest of the week is made up of uh, the history files. Which um, and thanks for thanks for the comments we've received on this stuff. Um, it's clear that there's a lot of interest, really, or, or, or sort of curiosity value still about this great industry's past. I mean, some of these photos we put with these videos, if they've ever been printed before, which in a lot of cases is doubtful, um, some of these are 30, 40, 50, 60 years old. And, and much like I've always believed that a, a classic car really needs to be driven and exercised, I think we need to um, we need to give these an airing uh, from the from the Total Kitco archive. Really, um, beautiful snapshots in time, um, highlights of, of of a real cracking little industry, and they deserve to be shown and seen and uh, all the rest of it. Anyway, without further ado, this time we're going to be looking at a little mark, a little car called the MCA Sports Coupe. Came from a company called MCA Cars. Uh, the man behind it was a chap called, uh, he was an ex-Italian racing driver called Aurelio Betzi, B-E-Z-Z-I. -Z uh, and he based himself in the, from the late 70s in, in Bognor Regis in West Sussex. Um, name MCA, actually, for the last 40 years, since the car first appeared in 83. Um, crikey, did that long. Um, we've always, it's always been documented as, MCA standing for Motor Company Aurelio, which is logical and fair enough, and uh, all the rest of it makes uh, makes sound sense. And um, until recently, um, it was pointed out to me that actually uh, there's a little twist to that, which I, I think is a delicious little story. Um, Aurelio apparently married into the uh, the huge McAlpine construction family, and it's been said that that they might have financed the project and. Um, indirectly financed it and MCA is actually a tip of the hat to, to McAlpine and I can see that and if you look at it you can see where the MCA comes from if you take it from take it out of the first three letters of McAlpine um, and I so hope that that story is true uh, although I can't sort of confirm it one way or the other um, but anyway 1981 I think it was he really told me that he had a dream to build his own car um, the only problem, well, problem, it wasn't really a problem because he achieved it, but his problem really was that he had no idea for a car. He he, he knew he wanted to be two seats. Uh, he knew he wanted the engine behind the driver. And uh, the donor, this was his real big bullet point, double stamp, star, had to be Fiat 126 based. Uh, and he really, really wanted to use the you know, that brilliant little 594cc or 600 um, Fiat engine. Um, that's kind of where he, as far as he got. 1983 saw him turn up at the workshop door 
uh, of uh, a great little company in in in, in Tangmere, uh, on the airfield there, the old airfield site, uh, called Mako Mako Mako, which is a shark uh, fiberglass, run by Mike Rutherford and Pete Benson, and they had a little team around them around them. And unless if you were unless you were Dutton, Pilgrim, and probably Eagle Cars. Every other kit car manufacturer that came out of Sussex and parts of Hampshire and beyond um, went to Mako for their fiberglass uh, for the bodies and stuff. Uh, until recently, I managed to track Mike down. Now, Mike has been quite elusive. He's retired now. Spends his, spits his time between Italy and a lovely house in Horsham in West Sussex. Um, he uh, Most of the people that we deal with uh, in terms of uh, subjects for... Uh, industry greats which is a series we run in in the magazine where we look at old legends of the industry and uh, notable people um they're only too happy to 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 chart their their history and we talk about their legacy and the left of the left and a lot of them have left a massive legacy and deserve recognition wider recognition than even we can provide really uh don't need asking twice whereas mike or Michael, as he prefers to be called, but as he was known as Mike in the industry back in the day, I'm going to—I've told him this. I'm going to keep—I'm going to call him Mike for, the, for for our purposes here. Uh, he really was quite evasive. <laughs> um, asked me actually on the phone the first time I, I contacted him, managed to get hold of him through a friend of a friend of a friend, um, if I thought I had the right Mike Rutherford because he hadn't really done anything worthy of such interest. Uh, and when I pointed out and calmed him down and told him that what I knew. And why I thought we should be looking at his career. And it was only right, really, that we did so. Because we owe him. Um, he was OK. Um, but he always liked to hide his light uh, under a bushel or whatever that saying is. He always liked to keep a low profile. And he, he really liked it that way. Um, but it's been a pleasure working with Mike in recent months. And uh, indeed, he, his history, history fire, uh, his industry great series um, uh, feature will be the January February issue of TKC Mag out on December the 30th, I think, 2023. Although subscribers and and trade will will get copies before Christmas, um, and that's that's really quite good. It's been been great talking to Mike, and, and I learned a lot from that because I've already outlined that I I knew about his his uh, his kit car input. Um, so like cars like the Mo- Mohawk, the Magic. Um, all Jago bodies were well, initially for the first few years anyway. Um, were all done, all done by um, by Mako. Now, what I didn't know until getting hold of Mike again was that um, just how much other stuff he did or, or Mako did. Um, in in addition to being really gr- a really great fiberglass laminator, Mike was also a development engineer and designer and uh, race race car preparation specialist really um he um his father was actually a doctor uh he was, i think he was born in stains and when they he, the family moved to bogner sort of area chichester area uh, when mike was a young lad and uh he kind of upset his dad i think that he didn't really want to be a doctor and he ended up working for jeff jago and richard park in emsworth initially before they moved to quarry lane in chichester um, so he worked for Jago and um, Rodding Scene, with the two companies that were kind of separate but interlinked, um, and that's where he kind of sort of put, uh, cut his teeth in the automotive game as well as on in sort of motorcycles and custom choppers and such like. So that's his background. Um, it, it, it really, I didn't realise also that. Uh, Mako were back in back in the day, back in the sixties, seventies, and certainly the early part of the eighties, I think. Um, whereas racing car bodies are are, are carbon fibre these days, or, or or even more exotic composite comp, um, blends and compounds, um, they were they their bodies were made from GRP, um, just like a kit car was really. And there was three or four main companies doing those bodies for pretty much ninety nine percent of that industry. Uh, in Britain anyway. Um, there was uh, Specialised Mouldings, uh, the Masters, really, in Huntingdon, founded by Peter, uh, run by Peter Jackson. Um, they happened to be next-door neighbours to the company that produced most of the chassis for these companies, as well as the Caterham 7, of course, and Lotus 7, Arch Motor and Engineering. Then you had FKS Fiberglass down in Poole, run by Jim Finch with his buddy, the other Jim Clark. Um 
Then there was Marchant in Cox, uh, not far from TKC Towers in, in, in Robertsbridge in East Sussex. And finally, there was there was Mike uh, at Mako Fiberglass, and he was doing an awful lot of work for various manufacturers, Church Farm, Church Farm Racing, uh, Ram, uh, Lec, at least he, uh, the, the electronics company, but David Purley was the driver, late David Purley, uh, and, 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 and loads of others in between. Uh, they were also doing a lot of industrial fiberglass. They were doing window frames and such like. But um, anyway, that covers really Mako. Um so Aurelio turned up on the doorstep of, of Mako with the idea, or the three bullet points that I mentioned earlier. It had to be a two-seater. It had to have an engine behind the driver, and it had to, had to be based, double star on that one, Fiat 126. I think he wanted, really, he could see that the X19 was a car that, that, that was a good little car, but could be beaten, and he reckoned he could beat it. Only trouble is he didn't know what it should look like and, and, and how he should get there, really. He... he, he he knew a he wanted to get the z but he had no clue of the in between and that's where mike came in so so mike and his team um developed it created it designed it um got jago to do a ladder frame twin rail chassis for it lovely little very delicate little chassis uh and worked around the fit 126 requirement um Apparently, according to Mike, Aurelio had very little. He used to go to the uh, Mako workshop pretty much every day, every couple of days, uh, and just watch what was going on, let him get on with it. Um, nice guy. I always found him a really nice guy, a really pleasant guy. Um, chain smoker. So Mike said those, these were the days where you could smoke indoors and in pubs and God knows what else, certainly in England. And um, he used to leave a trail of, I think he said Peter Stuyvesen, um, heady aroma behind him, um, <laughs> which I don't think they liked very much, but that was how it was back in those days. Um, while the car, one of the photos we've, we've put with this little audio um, is a lovely photo. It, it was taken at Tangmere and the plug, uh, prototype plug of the MCA Sports Coupe was just been rolled out into blinking into the daylight for the first time, I think. And the photo shows... Uh, Dear old Aurelio on the on the extreme left. In the centre there is is Pete Benson, the late Pete Benson, I'm afraid to say. And on the right is uh, is Michael Rutherford. Um, now I'm not going to respond to the wags that have said he looked like the chap from the Grumble Reeds, or even there's a bit of a Barry Gibb of the Bee Gees likeness. I couldn't possibly comment on that, but I thought Mike was was a pretty cool dude. He still is indeed. Um, moving swiftly on. While the development work was going on, Aurelio did a deal with uh, with Fiat tuners, Ital Tune, um, and he got them to come up with a specific tuning kit for the MCA's uh, for the MCA's purposes, uh, based around the five nine four or the six hundred Fiat engine, <coughs> which I think only produced something stupid like twenty eight horsepower. Um, I'm not certain that they went to the moon with it. I think it only ended up with about 40, 42 horsepower, but it made a bit of a difference. Although I'm not sure how many of the claimed 23, or was it 26 claimed? A quick, hasty look at the book of words. 26, apparently. Um, how many had that option? But it certainly was an option, shall we say. Well, talking of 26, I mean, I have not. We're, talking, we're looking at, where are we now? October 2023. I'm trying to think when I last saw a, uh, an MCA sports coupe in the, in the flesh, as it were, and I don't think I've seen one for at least 10, 12 years. So that begs the point. I think we need to make the point. If you've got one or you know a, a bloke that's got one, could you please ask him or could you get in touch with us? Because we'd like to go and see one again. Um, brilliant little car. Absolutely brilliant. Tiny little thing. 600, 600 gram, kilos perhaps. Um, in my case, I had to jam myself into it, but once it was worth it, because once I got in there, what a beautiful little car. Wheel at each corner. Uh, it steered where you wanted it to steer uh, rather than steer itself. Um, the chassis was a was a basic rudimentary little affair, but it was certainly up to the job. And that buzzy little buzz bomb of an engine was just a delight. And you could ring, ring its neck and it would still come back for more uh, it's just a beautiful thing i think i drove it around tangmere once which do dodging the potholes there i think and the bushes growing in the middle of the old runways but uh, it's great fun loved it really good little car got a lot of got a love for that car um anyway um 
that's kind of where we were. I, I'm not certain if it was, and I, I very, very uh, remiss of me, I didn't check with Michael, and I will do. Um, I'm not sure if they developed a convertible version or whether it, that came later. But either so, there was a convertible version. Um, or convertible, it basically had the centre section of that little roof panel chopped out and um, um, a, a hood in its stead. Um, I think dear old Aurelio had realised by sort of late 87 or so that he kind of wasn't going to be a new Fiat. Um, so he, I think it coincided, he, he went back to Italy in 88 um, and the project stayed here. And it moved to a chap called Graham and I'm going to, struggle with his surname and forgive me if i get this wrong it's uh, it was produced m-i-g-h-e-double-l miguel miguel um regardless of that he planned to continue in production with it but i think he, he was an engineer although i think he was semi-retired engineer um uh, but i think he found it too much to chew that it was too much of a sandwich to chew really and he, he didn't proceed with it for whatever reason uh interestingly then um I think it was it was it was sort of just just laid laid sort of quiet for a while. Then it suddenly appeared at a new manufacturer called Minari Minari Engineering, um, which uh, well at that time well who at that time hadn't launched their brilliant Alpha based Romeo uh, Romeo based Minari, which was another cracking car that will appear in a, a later episode of. Um, the History File series, that you can be sure. Um, what a brilliant car that was. Um, and they kind of used the MCA as a practice test bed, I think, for, 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 for when they became a, a manufacturer proper, shall we say. But they did sell a couple, I think, um, the Prendergasts. And uh, they, 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 yeah, they sold a couple, but then, of course, they moved on very much to their own design, the, the Minari. That left... Um, and once again, the MCA was left sort of a bit high and dry, really. Um, Listair, who got hold of the Pelland Sports, um, every time I mention another project, I think, oh my gosh, that could be a subject for, for the history files. Dear old Peter Pelland, what a, a legend that man was. Um, I think we could safely say we'll cover him at some stage. He, he had quite a history, um, just to say the least. Um, that uh, they that, so Dash or part of Listair who who made Microlite aircraft I think they took over the MCA. Um, not sure how many they sold. It wasn't very many, um, but it could have been them if it wasn't Michael uh, uh, working for uh, for Mr Betsy. Um, it was certainly them who came up with the convertible that we've we photographed here <clears throat> uh, of the shall we say, alleged 26 made. Aurelio would have done the lion's share of them, and I think he possibly did about 18. Um, I th Miguel didn't do any. I mean, no, he might have done three or four, um, and Dash might have done the others, the remainders. Um, There's certainly a couple of convertibles, and it could have been that, that uh, those were their input to the history of the car, really. It was with them for about four years, but I think it lay quiet for a couple of those. Um, and its last known resting place was with uh, a company from Suffolk called IPS Developments, who were um, producing the uh, the sorry the Morgan 44 lookalike Hadley Sprint, um, which was kind of overshadowed a little bit by the GCS Hawk, which was a good car, really good car. Um, and, and that's it. That was that was by eighty by ninety six. They packed up and brought the shutters down on their workshop for the last time. And that was it for the Hadley and the MCA coupe. I'm not certain what happened to that little project. It's a lovely little car, as I said. It didn't um, want for lack of marketing. That's for sure. Well, certainly from Aurelio, because as soon as he got hold of that car, he was marketing it. He was going to all the kit car shows of the day. Um, a real character, always had a crowd around him, always held court with his little car, promoting the hell out of it. Um, and he advertised in, 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 in all the magazines of the day. Certainly um, uh, Kit Car, Kit Cars and Specials that I work for. And, um, <coughs> excuse me, and um, Fibley's magazine, oh, sorry, he'll be round here to punch me in the throat if I'm not careful. 
Um, Peter Philby's Witch Kit magazine. Sorry, Peter, you know I love you. Um, he advertised in all of those. So it's hard to say, really. It's hard to quantify why it didn't. Certainly, it wasn't priced. It wasn't very expensive. It, it wasn't dear um, in comparison to other cars of the day. Perhaps the X19 was more attractive to people than anyone really thought, I suppose. There's certainly a lot of love for that car now. Um, but having driven both of them, I think that the the, the, the MCA Sports Coupe held, you know, held its own against that. Maybe it was the donor, but I thought about that, and, and there were one two sixes were quite abundant in, in uh, sort of forty years ago. There weren't masses of massive, massive amounts. There weren't a, a Fiesta or a Beetle in terms of quantities, but there was certainly enough to go around. I, I, um, maybe people just didn't maybe understand what they didn't think they understood the Fiat donor mechanicals when when Ford and Beetle ruled the, ruled the roost forty years ago. That's for sure in our game. Um, Mini as well, of course. Hard to know, but uh, it didn't get the traction or make the impact that I feel it, it deserved to. So, as I say, if you do know of someone with one, please get in touch because we'd love to, to talk to you or talk to them. Thank you for listening. Thank you for, for coming around here. Um, hope to welcome you again soon. I hope you're enjoying these, this series. If um, I've got to take care of a bit of business now, I'm being prompted again. Um, if you haven't already subscribed, please consider doing so. It won't cost you a penny piece. You just need to click that little button that says subscribe and make sure you hit the, uh, when your notifications thing drops down, I think it says all. If you click on that, that means you, you'll be notified every time we launch, well, launch, we, um, we, we publish a new video. And there's quite a lot of them coming around at the moment. So, um, yeah, you won't miss out if you do that. And if you could finally, <coughs> I'm told it helps the channel greatly because it makes more people aware because the videos appear in more feeds. If you could click um, like, that, I'm told, is good is, is good stuff for us. So if you could do that, I'll, I'll be eternally grateful. Once again, thank you so much for coming around. Oh, and if you like this, don't forget that every Friday... For 23 years now, I've been updating this little old website called TotalKitCar.com. Um, it seems to have, <laughs> talking attraction, done quite well in that respect. Um, I never missed, and I don't know if uh, people say I'm a mad fool, but I'm certainly full of passion, that's for sure, about the subject. Haven't missed a Friday update in all that time, even when I was uh, very ill one particular year. I remember that. I still managed to climb out of my bed and and put something on. And I always remember it. It was the, it was the week when Ansar Ali took over... And his um, venture capitalist group um, took over Catrum Cars, which would have been, what, 2007. <clears throat> I couldn't speak because my voice, uh, sore throat. And I just had a really bad case about a flu. And uh, I still dragged myself out. I always remember that. But anyway, that's that's that. Um, thanks again for listening. Um, wherever you are in the world, thank you. And uh, I hope you enjoy your day. And uh, I look forward to speaking to you again soon. Or, or, he, or, or you coming around here and welcoming you again soon. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.